Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading You Don't Know Everything, Jilly P by Alex Gino. We're gonna pick up where we left off with chapter 16, where Jilly and her family are about to go to uh, an event uh, for parents of kids with um, kids who are deaf. And Jilly is really excited because the boy that she has a crush on um, is maybe gonna be there. Chapter 16. That weekend, mom bum bundles Emma in a heavy winter coat that leaves her arms sticking out helplessly at her sides. It never gets very, old in very cold in California, so I don't know why mom even bought Emma a coat this heavy, much less actually put it on her. I think mom is still kind of nervous that Emma will get sick or that she already is. Emma doesn't need a hat though because she's already wearing the brown one with the flaps that cover her ears and keep her from playing with her hearing aids. It's called an aviator cap and dad has taken to call it, uh, calling Emma, um, <laughs> Emma Ilya uh, Earhart. I want to make a joke about ears where I pronounce it Earhart instead of Earhart, but I'm still waiting for the right moment. We drive to the University of California, Berkeley campus, where New Parents Night is happening. We park and follow the signs, first for the building and then for the room. We walk down a long hallway, turning left and then left and then left again, until I don't know how we're not back where we started. Finally, an arrow points us into a room, C-106A. Inside, about a dozen adults are sitting in a half circle of chairs with plastic blue seats and metal legs. The room smells a little musty, like someone used to store old files in here. Other people besides mom hold babies in their arms, but I'm the only older kid in the audience. Two families sit in front of the room, separated by three empty chairs. On the left, a little girl sits between her two moms. The women both have short brown hair and pale white skin, while the kid's complexion is dark and her long straight hair hangs in two braids. She swings her feet and bobs her head to the side so that the braids dance on her shoulders. On the, the right, a black teenager sits next to her mom and dad. Her face is a combination of his eyes and her nose with a bright smile all her own. A woman introduces herself to us as Karina Petrovsky. She's short with rosy pink skin and a smile as wide as her hips. She says that we're waiting for just a few more people to arrive. I look for profound, but no one seems to be him. Another family arrives a few minutes later, and Karina Petrovsky greets them as the Knights. Mr. Knight has thick, freckled cheeks under a checkered cap. Mrs. Knight is a little taller, a little darker, and she wears her ha hair in a large, shiny curl, and large, shiny curls that sit on her shoulders. Between them, and between them in height, is profound. I know that ear anywhere, with its curvy little dip at the top and the lobe that just won't quit. But unlike his online photo, he has two hearing aids, red plastic pieces that fit right inside the middles of his ears. He's wearing a black t-shirt that says Deaf Pride in large white block letters. Karina calls him Derek, Derek Knight. I feel my heart thumping double time and I realize just how nervous I am. Profound, I mean, Derek is in the room with me, with all of us really, but especially with me. They take a seat between the two other families. I think about going up to say hi to Derek, but before I can muster the nerve to do anything about it, the lights flicker overhead. Karina is at the switch. We'll get started now, she says. You'll notice that I use a visual way of gaining your attention. It's very common in deaf community to call a group together this way. Lights can also be used for doorbells and alarm clocks. I have officially learned more from this woman than from Miss Slap. Karina gives a PowerPoint presentation about the organizations that she works with to help deaf kids from infancy through high school. All sorts of agencies have different policies and rules, which is why people like her work individually with each case to help folks adjust to having a deaf member of the family. Mom takes notes on her phone. It's even more boring than it sounds, and not even Karina's cheerful voice can help with that. At least there's Derek to look at, but I try not to stare so much that he notices. I don't want him to think that I'm weird before we even get to meet. Well, in-person meet, anyway. To Karina's right, a woman in a black, long sleeve shirt signs everything Karina says. This is the first time I've seen so much signing in person, and when I'm not staring at Derek, my eyes are on her. Derek and the two other deaf kids aren't even looking her way the whole time, but her hands keep going. 
At first I try to make sense of what she's signing, since I just heard it, but she moves her hand so fast that I can't make out a single word. I think that maybe she has extra fingers. I wonder if I'll be able to sign like that someday if I practice enough. Finally, Karina is done with her last slide. Now I'd like to focus on our special guests, the Hoyt Cunninghams, Cunninghams, the Knights, and the Johnsons have all taken time out of their busy lives to be here with us today, so let's give them a round of applause. She lifts her hands in the air and shakes them. A few people in the audience follow along. The rest of us clap the way that we're used to. Karina reminds us that deaf people don't hear the sound that clapping makes. See, if I move my hands like this, she brings her hands together to clap, but doesn't let them touch. Pretty boring, huh? She shrugs. But how about this? She holds up her arms with her hands in front of her face and shakes her wrists so that her fingers wiggle about. Much more interesting to the eye, no? For now, let's try it again and welcome our guests. Karina waves her hands in the air again, and this time we all join in. Derek perks up as if he just notices us. He signs high several times with alternating hands. We laugh and Derek plays it up, tapping the teenager to his right on her shoulder and pointing at us as if to let her know that we're here. She acts all surprised and then starts waving too. Karina introduces the three families facing us. Jessica Johnson, sitting between her parents, is a high school senior at the California School for the Deaf. Derek is in seventh grade, also at California School for the Deaf. And Leah Hoyt Cunningham, sitting in her mom's lap, just started pre-K this year at public school in Berkeley. She's the only deaf student at her school, but she goes to a playgroup with, play with other deaf kids on Saturdays. The parents tell us more about their family. One of Leah Hoyt Cunningham's moms is deaf. She and her wife specifically chose to adopt a deaf baby. They learn from Mr. Johnson that Jessica is their only child and that they moved to Fremont so that Jessica could live at home and go to school with kids like her. Mr. and Mrs. Knight have two younger daughters, both of whom are hearing. Neither the Johnsons nor the Knight have any other deaf people in their family. It's just something that happens sometimes, Mrs. Knight shrugs. It doesn't matter why. What's important is how you live with it. About 90% of deaf and hard of hearing children are born to hearing parents, says Karina. And now that we have introductions out of the way, I thought you might like to hear from the students yourself. Remember to look at the signer, not the interpreter. The interpreter gets your ears, but the signers get, signer gets your eyes. Stare at Derek? I think I can manage that. Karina starts with Leah and asks her questions about school. Leah is little, but her hands are quick. I love school because I have a lot of friends there. So many friends. And we get to play in the sandbox every day after lunch. What about music class? Karina asks. My teacher lets me sit in the front. I hear better that way. Karina asks a few more questions and then invites her to show us her cochlear implant. Leah turns her head and brushes her hair out of the way so that we can all see the tan disc about the size of a quarter. The wire connects it to a piece of plastic tucked behind her ear and a thin clear tube comes from the plastic piece over the top of her ear and slips into her ear canal. Karina tells us, please notice that I would never approach a deaf or disabled person in the world and ask to see their assistance assistive devices, but this is an educational setting and I asked the students in advance if it would be okay. Leah's mom tells us about the process, but they don't mention anything about molds and screams. Instead, they talk about auditory nerves and electrodes. A hearing aid makes sounds louder, but a cochlear implant goes right into the parts of the ear that usually hear things and pokes at the nerve endings to tell them that sounds are happening. A cochlear implant isn't right for every situation. Not even Leah's deaf mom has one, but for Leah, it's been great. Then it's Derek's turn. It's great to have classmates who use my language, he signs. And the teachers, too. I started by going to a hearing school, but it didn't work for, it for me. In third grade, my parents decided, me to send, decided to send me to CSD. I stay there during the week, and I come home on weekends. It's kind of like sleepaway camp all year long, but with homework. At first, it's weird that the interpreter for Derek is the same voice as for Leah, but it talks so differently that I don't notice after a little while. And would you tell us about your hearing aids? Karina asks. Derek turns his head to each side so that we can get a good look at the red bits of plastic nestled in his middle ears. Thin clear tubes like Leah travel over his ears to attach to finger-sized plastic pieces, also red, behind his ears. They help me hear loud noises, but they aren't great for conversations and stuff. Like, I know when my mom is yelling at me, but I can't always understand what she's saying. 
Derek was having a lot of trouble learning to read in his local school, even with his hearing aids, Mrs. Knight says, but he picked it up fast after we transferred him to CSD, and now he's one of those kids who always has a book on him. When it's Jessica's turn, she signs, I love CSD too. I mean, it's school, but it's also like a second family. My teachers have helped me excel. I'm on varsity track, and I tutor kids from the lower school in math. She's really good, Derek says. Thanks, says Jessica. Eric was one of my first students, and he still asks me when he has math problems. Even when I'm in college next year, he can always call me. And where are your hearing aids? Karina asks. Mrs. Johnson lifts her eyebrows as if to say I told her to wear them. Jessica shrugs. I don't hear much with them at all. Not like Derek does, and they're really annoying in my ear. I like ASL better anyway. After that, Karina opens the conversation to questions from the audience. A man with a curly red beard wants to know when he should lo start learning sign. I'd get started now, Karina smiles. Your little one may not be ready yet, but once they start picking it up, they're going to be a lot faster than you. Karina reminds us that the handouts include information on beginning signing classes for parents. A woman near the door asks how to sign up for an appointment to talk with Karina individually. I'll be following up with each of you to see about in-home visits to discuss the specifics of your child's environment and how you can make your home more deaf friendly. I have questions for our guests who have come in here tonight to share what being a family with a deaf child is like. One thing I've been wondering, mom asks, is what it's like in public, out in the world. Do people stare when you're signing? They do sometimes, Mrs. Knight says, and it used to bother me, a lot. She closes her eyes for a moment, preparing her thoughts. For years and years it did. I left places early and sometimes I didn't go at all. Sometimes I stared just right back. I stared right back. Derek nods proudly at that. And then one day I was walking around with Janet. She's my middle child and she was just a toddler and she yelled out something in the store. I don't even remember what she said, but a dozen people turned around to look at her and then of course at me. And that's the moment I realized that folks are gonna judge me and mine no matter what we do. And sometimes people are gonna look at us funny when we sign. So does it bother me? A bit, I suppose, but we've got a child to raise and we can't let other people's issues get in the way of us living our lives and loving him. Hmm. I hear dad next to me as his head bobs up and down. Mom has her chin and half her cheek in her hand, looking thoughtfully. And as for Wally here, Mrs. Knight gestures at her husband. He just never cared much what people thought. Mr. Knight laughs. Oh, I care a lot what people think. It's just that the people whose thoughts I care about most, well, half of them are here right now, and the other two I kissed on the forehead before we dropped them off at your sister's. A few more people ask questions, and it sounds like some of the other parents are even more nervous than mom and dad. One of them quotes a professional who mentioned something about not signing to her child at all. I wouldn't be surprised if the professional was Miss Slap. I disagree completely, as do most of the agencies and doctors we work with, Karina says with a sour look on her face. You don't want to keep the doors locked just because you're trying to open a window. I look over at mom and dad who are eyeing each other. Dad lets out a deep breath and mom squeezes her hand. She whispers in his ear. I imagine she says, I'm glad we're not seeing her anymore. I can't actually hear her, but from the way they're holding their faces and their bodies, I know I'm at least close. Dad nods in agreement. Once there are no more questions, Karina announces that the program is complete, but that she and the family will be staying a bit to chat individually with people. She encourages us all to take handouts before we leave. I still don't know what to say to Derek or even how to approach him. I worry about it until it isn't a problem anymore, because now the problem is that he's already approached me and is looking at me right in the face, or looking down because he's about six inches taller than me. Hi, are you Jillian? He asks. The high pitch of his voice surprises me. He signs while he speaks, pointing at me and fingerspells something. I can only assume it's my name. I think I see the swoop of a J. I nod slowly and smile a smile that grows until I feel like it's taking over my face. I try to pull the corners of my mouth back in, and then I'm sure that I'm grimacing. I'm Derek. He puts out his hand. I know, I say. Well, that was stupid. I put out my hand and my fingers brush against his palm. My hand feels electric. I'm glad you came. Me too. I scratch my forehead with the hand he didn't touch, and then I get nervous that it's a sign, and I told him my underwear is pink or something. We stand there looking at each other. There he is, right in front of me. Nice to meet you, Derek finally says. Yeah, you too. See you online. Yeah, online, where my inner organs aren't trying to play musical chairs. Chapter 17. Derek and I talk online every day that week, even if it's only to say hi. 
We even stay up late on Friday night chatting about school and Vidalia and everything and nothing all at once. He tells me about how he came home to another lecture about making the bed, and I tell him that Karina Petrosky is coming over the next morning to talk to us about Emma. He says that she's really nice, but that she's always offering these disgusting hard candies that taste like cough drops. And that gets us on a whole discussion about her favorite candies and another half hour whooshes by. That's why I'm still asleep at nearly 10 a.m. the next morning when mom runs the vacuum cleaner. I get dressed quickly, annoyed that mom and dad were going to let me sleep right through Karina's visit. You know that she's not here to judge us on our housekeeping skills, right? I tell mom as I'm eating my cereal while she wipes every surface in the kitchen. I just want the place to look presentable, she says, punching up the couch cushions with her fist to puff them up. Not long after, an engine turns off right outside our house and a few minutes later, the car door closes. Still, mom jumps when the doorbell rings. I get there first. Hi there, Jillian. It's so good to see you again, Karina says like it really is. She extends her arm. It's comfortably warm. I didn't notice how, to, how attractive Karina was at New Parents Night. I was too focused on someone else. Her deep red lipstick brings out the highlights in her curly black hair. She's wearing a black blouse and a simple silver chain and a large black bag hangs from her shoulder. Mom and dad are behind me at this point and shake hands with her as well. Emma is lying on a blanket next to the couch. Won't you come in? Mom asks. Tea? Coffee? Karina takes a quick whiff of the air, which is filled with the aroma of fresh brew. Some joe would be delightful. Mom puts out three steaming red mugs and a tiny pitcher of half and half. The fancy sugar bowl from Mom's old china set is already on the table. Mom dusted it off this morning. Usually Mom and Dad spoon their sugar right from the paper sack. Mom, Dad, and Karina settle themselves at the kitchen table. Karina looks over at me. Jillian is welcome to be part of the conversation if she'd like. The more perspectives, the better. Would you like to join us, Jilly? Dad asks. I'm sitting at the fore side of the table before Dad has finished his questions, folding my hands neatly like a kid sitting at attention in first grade. Care for candy? Karina asks and starts rummaging at the bottom of her bag. No thanks, I say, glad for Derek's warning. Karina starts telling us about the Center for the Education of the Infant Deaf and how important it is it is to expose Emma to American Sign Language as early as possible. The more ASL she sees, the sooner she'll be able to communicate with you. I know I covered some of this at New Parents Night, but I like to be sure that everyone is up to see speed. Mom and Dad nod a lot, and they keep saying things like, I see, right, and that makes sense. Then Karina asks to see Emma and settles herself comfortably on the floor next to Emma's blanket. Karina holds a finger up and moves it back and forth, and then up and down, watching Emma's eyes carefully. So, are there other things that we should be doing, Mom asks, as Karina works? What's your take on cochlear implants, for instance? She tries to sound casual, but her voice breaks on the word cochlear. Karina nods slowly like she's heard this question before, and is pulling up her prepared response from a catalog in her mind. Cochlear implants are absolutely something to consider. Modern medicine has made outstanding advances in the field of audiology in the last few years. And yet, it's important for me to warn you that turning on a cochlear implant, well, it's not the same as hearing. People with CIs report that they have trouble with some sounds, especially voices. Still and all, many families of many of the families I see by see swear by them. Lilia's family from New Parents Night, for example, is very happy. Karina gives mom and dad a flyer about a beginning sign class and a brochure full of websites for parents of deaf children. Neither uses the phrase hearing loss. She always makes, she also makes arrangements to visit our home again in a few months. Before she leaves, I ask Karina about one of the most important signs that I've been looking for, a sign for Emma. Karina explains that there aren't just sign versions for each name, so everyone named Rebecca doesn't have the same name sign. And your name sign doesn't come from your parents unless your parents are deaf. A name sign is a gift from a member of the deaf community. But what about Emma, I ask? She doesn't know any other deaf people yet. Well, one option is to spell it out. Karina's fist pulses just for a minute and is back down before I can catch a single letter. Another is to develop a temporary name sign, at least until she receives one from the community. And what about me, I ask? How do I sign Jillian? I'm sure your sister will come up with a name sign for you soon enough. In the meantime, same as for Emma. She could spell, you could spell it out. She signs a J and then the rest of my name tumbles out of her hand before I can catch it. 
or come up with something temporary. Everything will come in time. For now, enjoy these special first months with your new baby. Talk to her, dance with her, sing to her. She might not hear you, but if you lay her on your chest, she'll feel your vibrations and keep signing. Katrina, mom, Karina, mom, and dad start discussing things like timelines and milestones after that, which are fancy ways of talking about whether Emma is growing faster or slower than average. It gets boring quickly. I go over to play with Emma, but she's falling and fallen asleep, so I pull out hearts and arrows. Two chapters later, mom and dad thank Karina for her time, and Karina thanks all of us for letting her into her, her home. I feel so good that I want to have a party to celebrate but mom and dad say that they need to head to the grocery store. With Emma asleep, I pull out my laptop and open a search engine and type in name signs for the deaf to learn more. The internet says that some name signs are based on the initials of a person's name. Others are based on what the person is like. I decide to do even better, I'll do both. The best thing that Emma does so far is smile. So I look up the sign for smile. There are a couple of options, but the one that I like best, you put your flat hands, palm down in front of your, your mouth, and then pull them back, kind of into a smile. And you need to smile when you do it too. So instead of the regular sign for smile, I make my hands into the shape of a letter E and make the same motions. Emma. I really like it, especially because it almost looks like the way she rubs her fists into her face when she's tired. I'm so proud of my creation that I log on to Delacorp to show it to Derek. He's in my, online, so I open a private conversation. You have found a quiet garden path and invite Profound in Oaktown for a private stroll. Julian P. Hey, Profound in Oaktown. What's up? Julian P. I made up a sign. Profound in Oaktown. You what? Julian P. I mean a name sign, not like a new word or anything. It's for Emma. Profound in Oaktown. You didn't. Julian P. It's the sign smile, but with an E for Emma. Profound in Oaktown, you have to know that I'm giving you a nasty look right now. Julian P, what? Why? Profound in Oaktown, you can't just go making up signs like that. Julian P, why not? Profound in Oaktown, because it's rude. Julian P, but that's what Karina said to do. Profound in Oaktown, so you're going to listen to what some hearing person said over me? Julian P, but I followed all the rules about how to make them. Profound in Oaktown, you're not deaf. Jillian P, so? Profound in Oaktown, so name signs come from deaf people. That's just how it works. It's one of the perks. Jillian P, I mean, I get that it's usually that way, but Emma doesn't know any deaf people. Profound in Oaktown, not yet she doesn't. Just spell it. It's not like Emma's a long name. It'll be good practice. I was just trying to help, Jillian P, I was just trying to help. Profound in Oaktown, sometimes that's not her job. Jillian P. But I'm older, her older sister. Profound in Oaktown. But nothing. You're hearing and that's it. I gotta go practice my dance routine. And don't bother asking. Yes, deaf people can dance. Even the really deaf ones. Google it. Profound in Oaktown has left the garden path. You're alone with your thoughts. The hard thing about ac accidentally saying the wrong thing is you don't know what's the wrong thing until you've already said it and hurt someone. And even if you didn't mean it that way, you can't take it back. I distract myself with some kids post that Roses and Thorn Thrones is going to end with author exclaiming, exclaiming rulership of the land. And I'm four paragraphs into an impassioned response about how wrong she is when I hear the jingle that announces a new chat window. I stop typing immediately. Profound in Oaktown has invited you to the secluded banks of the River Valor. Enjoy, uh, enjoy your privacy. Profound in Oaktown. I wasn't trying to be mean, you know. Jillian P. I know. Profound in Oaktown. But seriously, a name sign's a deaf thing no matter what some hearing lady says. I'm sorry, Jillian P. I'm sorry. I won't use it again. Profound in Oaktown. Okay. Jillian P. What's your name sign? Profound in Oaktown. First promise to never use the silly one that you made up again. Jillian P. I promise. A moment later, an animated image pops up in the chat. It's of Derek. The first thing I notice is that my stomach doesn't jump. I mean, he looks fine and everything, but not, like, fine. He's still got that cheesy smile, though. Derek is looking directly at the camera and with a friendly face. He raises a slightly bent pointer finger above his eye and wiggles it, kind of like an eyebrow moving up and down. The image loops, and then he does it again and again and again. I watch it carefully, and then I copy it myself. 
for found in Oaktown. That's my name sign. Jillian P. Thanks for showing it to me. It's pretty cool. For found in Oaktown. Your sister will probably get one if she goes to a deaf school. And if you're really lucky, maybe she'll give you one. Jillian P. I hope so. For found in Oaktown. You're pretty cool most of the time, Jay. Jillian P. Thanks. For found in Oaktown. For a hearing person. Smiley face. Jillian P. Smiley face. For found in Oaktown. Well, back to dance practice. Jillian P. I bet you're great. You have left for found in Oaktown at the riverbank. After I log off, I practice Derek's name sign at least a hundred times. I want to be able to sign his name as easily as I say Macy's. Chapter 18. Christmas morning is a flurry of presents. I get some great stuff, including a scooter, a wooden jewelry box, and a beautiful necklace and a bracelet with purple amethyst stones to go in it a gift card for buying music online, four graphic novels, an amazing purple, magically mysterious Vidalia fleece jacket, Vidalia pens and stationery, a Vidalia coloring book, and a huge poster of Gwinella that I'm gonna hang on the ceiling of my bedroom. Emma gets all sorts of clothes and toys. Her pile of presents is so big that she could sit on it like a mountain. It's amazing how large things can be for a person so little. I give Emma a t-shirt that says, I love being a baby. All of the letters are made from babies sitting and standing in different positions. Mom says it's precious. Mom gets a new single cup French press from me. She usually drinks coffee about two hours after dad makes it, and she's always complaining that it's cold. This way she can make her own when she gets up. I give dad a fancy lemon squeezer and some gourmet peppercorns. Dad says that if he can't eat it or eat with it, it's not much of a gift. When we're done with presents, mom bakes pies, apples, and p apple and pumpkin, not sweet potato, while I download some new music and dad reads a book about the history of the tomato in Italy that mom gave him. He's really into Italian cooking. Mom jokes that the wedding was nice, but she really knew that he loved her two years later, the first time he let her stir his tomato sauce while he took a nap. Did you know that the tomato originated in the Andes Mountains of South America? Dad says, the first ones reached Italy less than 500 years ago. I wonder what people put on their pasta before that, I say. Probably olive oil. Blech. Don't knock nature's greatest emollient. Emollien. By the way, what's red and invisible? What? My what is more an exclamation of what are you talking about than actually asking him to give the answer, but he responds with pride. No tomatoes. I laugh and then I wonder whether I get it and they decide that that's part of what makes the joke so amazing and laugh more. Once mom is done baking, we pile into the car and it's like Thanksgiving all over again, except for I'm not as hungry and I have a new graphic novel to read. Mom, dad, and even Emma are in good moods and the car is a happy bubble on its way to Aunt Lou's and Uncle Sal's house. Dad puts on the classy Christmas mix CD Aunt Alicia made for me when I was little. We listen to it every year on the drive to Aunt Lou and Uncle Saul's. It has a couple of popular songs on it, some really pretty ones, and a few silly ones, too. My favorite is about a Santa Claus who never shows up and is a possibly related chimney clog. A few songs and I get an idea. I already know the sign for Santa Claus, which is about showing his big bushy beard. I pull out my phone and I learn two new signs for the day. By the time Bruce Springsteen starts to sing, I'm ready. I can't do the verses, but when we hear the chorus, I turn to Emma and say, sign, Santa Claus is coming to town. Well, I can sign, Santa Claus, come in town anyway. And then again and again, along with the music. Dad turns around and notices what I'm doing and asks me to show him the sign. Mom learns them too, even though she can only use one hand because she's driving. By the end of the song, Emma is smiling and waving her fists. And I wonder whether she's trying to copy us. The other songs on the CD are harder because they don't sing the same words over and over again. But I try to sign Santa Claus to Emma whenever a song about the big jolly guy comes on. And when the Muppets sing the 12 days of Christmas, I can sign most of the numbers, as well as day and Christmas. There are similar signs, but in opposite directions, which is fun and also pr pretty. After the CD is done, Dad goes back and plays Santa Claus is coming to town again. We sing at the top of our lungs and sign the parts that we know. When we pull up to Aunt Lou and Uncle Saul's house, though the joy in the car fades. We're the first ones here, and besides our kids, Annie, Matt, and Jaden, the only other people coming are Graham, Uncle Mike, and Adriana.
Aunt Alicia told me last week that she, Aunt Joanne, Jamila, and Justin are staying home today. We don't need to deal with a repeat of Thanksgiving, and we certainly don't need to deal with my homophobic folks. Nah, the best present we can give each other is a day of rest. Inside, Matt and Jaden are in the middle of the living room, still in their pajamas, surrounded by Legos and tiny cars and picture books and a taffy making kit and all sorts of other toys and boxes and wrapping paper. Annie is probably in her room. Aunt Lou orders Matt and Jaden upstairs to get changed and tells them to send Annie down. Annie flops under the couch with her cell phone and a giant sigh, texting with lightning thumbs. She's lucky, though. Adriana will be here any minute, and then she'll have someone for the rest of the day. I never have anyone in my age at family things, and now not even my favorite aunt won't be here. No one, used, no one to wink at me from the, across the room. No one to cuddle me while we are watching football. No one to call me Jelly Bean. Graham arrives with two big bags of presents and sweeps around the room with a round of kisses. She lands on Emma, scooping her out of Uncle Saul's arms and into her own. Sweet marmalade, she's grown so much in the last month. Oh look, she's holding her head up. Matt and Jaden have already separated the gifts into pile for each person by the time Uncle Mike and Adriana arrive. And the grown-ups decide that it's long enough before dinner that we can open our presents now. Matt and Jaden cheer. I get a purple sweater and three pairs of jeans from Aunt Lou and Uncle Saul. A couple of cool, magically mysterious Vidalia t-shirts from Uncle Mike and Adriana, and a white leather purse I'll probably never use, and some more Vidalia stationery from Graham. It's too bad that all of my Vidalia friends are online. My family op opens presents one at a time, and everyone has to watch each gift being unwrapped, so dinner is ready by the time we're done. With two extra seats in the table available, and with half of M and Trip J gone, the adults decide that Matt, Jade, and I will all get to sit at the main table. Mom thought that I'd be excited, but I would rather sit at the kids' table and have Aunt Alicia and Aunt Joanne here. The middle of the table fills with trays and bowls of food, ham instead of turkey, with pineapple chunks and cherries instead of cranberry sauce, but otherwise it looks and tastes a lot like Thanksgiving. I still love buttered corn. I still hate buttered turnips. How's school? Aunt Lou asks. Fine, I say. She doesn't ask me to elaborate the way that Aunt Alicia does when I give a one-syllable answer. Are you enjoying having a baby sister? Uncle Saul asks. I guess. So, says Uncle Mike, and I'm almost glad he says something until he continues. How do you think Alicia and Joanne are doing today? Do you think that we're ha they're having an almighty sweet potato pie? Everyone else's muscles tense as one. Mike? Graham says her son's name as if she's issuing a first warning, which she pretty much is. What? I'm just kidding. Adriana buries her head into her hands. Not again, Dad, okay? Not again what? Not speaking my own mind? I get to have thoughts too, you know, and unlike some people, I don't refuse to come just because someone hurt my feelings. No one says Aunt Alicia's name, but it hangs in the air, making everything on my plate taste bitter. Uncle Mike keeps at it, and all because of an old story about Dad and Mom being curious about dessert. It's not just that, I say. And the whole table turns to look at me, even Matt and Jaden, who stopped building green bean towers to watch me talk back to adults. I better make this good. Then what is it? Uncle Matt smirks at me like he stuck me with a question I can't answer. It's racism, I say. And I watch the mouths of the adults drop around the table. Whoa now, says Uncle Matt. Uncle Mike, I'm not a racist. Graham shakes her head, and I'll not be called one by someone who's not old enough to remember Rodney King, much less Martin Luther King Jr. No one's saying that you're a racist, says Mom. Sure sounds like your daughter is, Uncle Mike says. What I'm saying is that racism is a big problem, like really big, and sometimes you don't even know you're doing it. All I wanted was to taste sweet potato pie, says Graham, and I don't see what's so wrong about that. Aunt Alicia says it's all related, and that it hurts even if you didn't mean to. Wow, it's like having that woman here anyway, says Uncle Matt. Uncle Mike. Her name is Alicia, says Mom. I know. Then stop calling her that woman. Fine, it's like having Alicia here anyway. And what about Justin and Jamila, I ask? Do you want something bad to happen to them when they get older? It's not like that, Jilly. Aunt Lou tries to soften the blow. But Aunt Alicia wouldn't, and I'm not going to either. Black kids get shot all the time, and it keeps happening because no one does anything about it. This is not dinner conversation, says Graham. It's just not the right time. Then when is the right time to talk about families who can't get all together for Christmas? 
The table goes silent. No one answers my question. I'm going to go get coffee started, says Aunt Lou after a moment. Well, Graham and Mom clear the table. Uncle Saul loads the dishwasher. Adriana and Annie run upstairs, and Matt and Jaden take Matt's new juggling kit to the basement to practice. Uncle Mike sits on the couch and turns on the football game. Dad puts his arm around my shoulders and invites me to join him on the front porch. Outside, he sits down and pats the chair next to him. Are you mad at me, I ask? Mad? He makes a wrinkled face of disbelief. Why, I don't know if I've ever been prouder of you. But I yelled at Uncle Mike. If anyone deserves to be yelled at, it was Uncle Mike. And you weren't just yelling, you were naming what was happening. He takes my hand in his. I can still feel the word racism in my mouth. Are you okay? Dad asks, squeezing my palm. Yeah, I say. Then I'm going to check in with your mom and figure out what we're going to do. You don't have to come inside if you don't want to. I don't want to. Dad gives me a kiss on the forehead and goes inside. I pull out my, f my phone and text Aunt Alicia. Uncle Mike is a real jerk. She answers less than a minute later. She doesn't ask why, and I don't go into details. Aunt Alicia. Has been since the day I met him. Me. I'm sorry you have to deal with people like him. Aunt Alicia. Me too. Me. I called what he said at Thanksgiving racist. Aunt Alicia. It sure was. Me. And what Graham said too, even though it was different. Aunt Alicia. Good job, Jellybean. Me. I wish you could be here today. Aunt Alicia. I do too. Me. I love you, Aunt Alicia. Aunt Alicia, I love you too. I'm still staring at our last text, pressing the button so that the screen stays lit, when Dad comes back outside, followed by Mom with Emma in her arms. You did good in there, Mom says with a smile. I don't know that it was the most polite way to go about those things. I don't think polite works with Uncle Mike, I say. Dad holds back his laughter with a snort. Fair point, Mom says. I'm really proud of you for sticking up for what's right, Chili. This time, it's the Perlos leaving the holiday family dinner before dessert and without any leftovers. Bruce is still wailing about being good for goodness sake when Dad starts the car, but Mom turns it down and changes the station. None of us are in the mood to sign about Santa anymore. I close my eyes, and by the time we're on the highway, Mom and Dad think I'm asleep. They're still talking in low tones in the front seat, and I can't make out a lot of what they're saying, but I can tell that they're talking about me and how glad they are that I stood up to Mike. Both mom and dad are proud of me, and I'm proud of me, too. So why do I feel so icky? That's where we're going to stop today. We'll pick up tomorrow with chapter 19. We've been reading You Don't Know Everything, Jilly P. by Alex Gino. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening today, and I'll see you again soon. Bye!